Good evening aspirants. I welcome you all to the Hindu Daily News Analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the newspaper dated 25th of July 2023. Displayed here is a list of articles that we will take up for discussion today. Go through it. Now we will start with the first article discussion. Look at this news article from the science page. See, recently we are seeing various news articles about the steps taken by India to transform itself into a semiconductor manufacturing hub. But what exactly is India trying to manufacture? And is India moving in the right direction? The article here tries to answer these questions. See, in this context in our discussion today, we are going to first see some basics and later we are going to see the points mentioned in this article. Now let us start the discussion by seeing the basics about transistors. Now do you remember this image from our school books? Here we have a JFET transistor and a schematic diagram of a transistor. You might have noticed this component in various integrated circuits. See these transistors are made from semiconductor materials usually silicon. They have a special property. They can change their electrical conductivity based on the input they receive. This property of the transistor is used to do make it act like a tiny electronic switch. In simple words, a transistor is an electronic device that acts like a tiny controller for electricity. Basically, what I am trying to tell you here is a transistor is like a tiny switch that can control the flow of electricity. It can turn the electricity on or off or it can make it flow more or less. This is just like how you can control the flow of water from a tap. See, transistors are essential in electronic devices like computers and smartphones because they help in processing and amplifying electrical signals. It plays a crucial role in modern technology and allows us to build powerful computers, smartphones and many other electronic gadgets. See, there are three main components to a transistor. They are emitter or the source, base or gate and a collector or a drain. The transistor is like a faucet system. The emitter is like the water source, the base is like a control knob and the collector is like the sink. Remember this analogy while we discuss about these three components. So emitter is like the source of electricity. It releases electrons into the transistor. The base is like the control center. When a small current flows into the base, it decides whether to let more electricity pass through it or not. Finally, the collector is like the destination for electricity. If the base allows it, the electron flows from the emitter to the collector. So these are the three components of a transistor. Now let me explain the way a transistor functions with another analogy. Imagine the emitter and collector as two water tanks and the base as a valve that can control the water flow between them. This valve opens or closes in response to the supply of electric current. Initially, let us assume that the valve is closed. When a small current is applied to the valve, it opens and so the water flows from the emitter tank to the collector tank. When this small current is removed, the valve closes and in turn prevents the flow of water from the emitter tank to the collector tank. The transistor works in a similar way. When no current flows into the base, the valve is closed and no electricity can flow from the emitter to the collector. This state is like turning off a switch. But when a small current is applied to the base, electricity can flow from the emitter to the collector. This state is like turning on a switch. So basically the transistor acts like a tiny switch. The magic of the transistor lies in its ability to amplify the small current at the base into a much larger flow of electricity from the emitter to the collector. By controlling this flow of electricity, the transistor can perform various tasks. They act as switches enabling or disabling the flow of current. They can also act as amplifiers taking a weak signal and making it stronger. This property is vital for processing information in computers and other electronic devices. For example, modern computers use transistors in circuits called logic gates. These gates take input signals in the form of zeros and ones. Here, zeros being off state and one being the on state. 
these logic gates perform basic operations like addition comparison and decision making think of logic gates as tiny decision makers that follow specific rules this depends on the input they receive to produce an output by combining many transistors and logic gates together computers can perform complex calculations and execute various tasks the transistors are also used to store data in a computer transistors are mainly used in random access memory as we all know ram is a type of temporary storage that holds data the computer is currently using each bit of data either as a one or zero is stored in a tiny transistor when the computer needs to access specific data it can quickly find and retrieve it from the ram these are the important applications of a transistor moving forward let us see a few more terminologies to understand the article better the first is gate length as we saw earlier gate is another term used to describe the base of the transistor the gate length in a transistor refers to the physical length of the gate region you can see this in the image to have a better understanding the next one is pitch see in an integrated circuit metal layers are used to do root signals and connect different parts and pitch or metal pitch refers to the spacing between adjacent metal interconnects on a transistor this is also shown in the image here the next one is transistor density device density or transistor density refers to the number of transistors that can be packed into a given area on a semiconductor chip see the size of transistors have progressively shrunk over the years that is the gate length and the pitch has reduced over the years the smaller a transistor becomes the more of them can fit on a semiconductor chip now imagine transistors are like tiny workers on a construction site and they will help to build electronic devices like computers and phones so what happens when the transistors become smaller when the transistors become smaller it is like having tinier workers these tiny workers take up less space on the construction site so now more tiny workers can fit on the site so what i'm trying to tell you here is when transistors are smaller we can fit more of them on a semiconductor chip so now this increases the device density with the increase in device density the more data can be stored in the chip in addition to this there is significant increase in chip performance and power efficiency to give you a perspective look at this figure see in the early 1970s the transistor density per square millimeter on a chip was around 200 whereas a chip within an iphone has around 100 million transistors per square millimeter so over the years the gate length and pitch has come down and as a result the transistor density has increased the last important terminology is node number see earlier that is from 1960 to 1990 the node number was equal to the gate length or half of the metal pitch for example the 500 nanometer node transistor has a gate length and a metal half pitch of 500 nanometer but currently this is not followed the node number has now become an arbitrary number and it is not equated to any physical property of the transistor like gate length or half pitch so the transistor makers have been using the node number to represent the improvement in the transistor for example the 13th generation intel processor features 7 nm transistors while the 12th generation intel processor features 10 nm transistors so even though the numbers that is 10 and 7 have lost meaning people have come to identify that 7 nanometer performs better than 10 nanometer So these are some basic informations about transistor. See, as we all know, a government has been taking various measures to give a push to semiconductor manufacturers in India. Now, what exactly is India trying to manufacture? See, India's current focus is on the manufacture of 28 nm nodes, 63 nm nodes and 90 nm nodes. These are called legacy nodes. Here, legacy nodes refers to older or previous generations of semiconductor process technology these legacy nodes are considered outdated 
This is because currently the latest computers and mobile devices use chips in the 10nm to 5nm node range. Now you may have a question. Why is India focusing on making outdated chips that is 28nm node or higher rather than focusing on 10nm or 5nm chips? The answer is that India is currently taking baby steps in the semiconductor industry. So, starting with legacy nodes can offer numerous advantages. See, as I already said, the most advanced nodes are used in devices like smartphones and laptops. But legacy nodes are most popular in the robotics, defense, aerospace, industry automation tools, automobiles, internet of things and image sensor sector. This is because the legacy nodes are cheaper than the advanced nodes. So, it is a rational choice to start with the legacy nodes, acquire experience and knowledge over time and finally move on to the advanced nodes. This will help India in realizing the dream of becoming a semiconductor hub of the world. This is all regarding this discussion. With the learn points in mind, now we will move on to the next article discussion. Look at this news article. It says that the National Company Law Tribunal has accepted a petition for insolvency against Coffee Day Global Limited. The application was made under Section 7 of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. NCLT has orally admitted the plea allowing the initiation of the corporate insolvency resolution process for Coffee Day Global. This is all about the news article. In this context, let us discuss about the insolvency and bankruptcy code in detail. See, insolvency occurs when a company can't pay back the money it owes to its creditors. In a growing economy like India, this is a significant problem because it can lead to a lack of credit flow and the accumulation of bad loans. So in order to address this issue, the Indian government introduced the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code in 2016. Here, what is the meaning of insolvency and bankruptcy? See, insolvency in simple terms means a situation where individuals or companies are unable to repay their debt. And bankruptcy simply means the formal declaration of insolvency by the court. Now, we shall see why IBC was created and what are its advantages. See, in the last several years, the banking sector had been burdened by growing non-performing assets. As of 2015, insolvency resolution in India took 4.3 years on an average. This was higher when compared to other countries. The Bankruptcy Legislative Reforms Committee under the leadership of TK Vishwanathan formulated the IBC. Subsequently, Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code was implemented in 2016 in order to resolve the insolvency cases in short time. Note that IBC applies to companies, partnerships and also to individuals. It provides for a time-bound process to resolve insolvency. The code created various institutions to facilitate resolution of insolvency. These are insolvency professionals, adjudicating authorities and insolvency and bankruptcy board. Also note that the proceedings for companies will be adjudicated by the National Companies Law Tribunal and the proceedings for individuals will be adjudicated by Debt Recovery Tribunal. Now we will see how the insolvency resolution works. Imagine you have a friend named Alex who runs a small business. See, Alex's business has been struggling lately and they are finding it hard to repay the loans they took to start the business. They have reached a point where they cannot pay their debts on time and the situation is getting worse. At this point, either the creditors of Alex, that is, the people or banks who lent money to Alex or Alex himself can apply for insolvency. Insolvency means that the business is unable to pay its debts. When they apply for insolvency, the matter is taken to a special court called the National Company Law Tribunal. Once the NCLT accepts the application, they appoint an interim resolution professional, that is IRP. The interim resolution professional is like a temporary supervisor who takes charge of the business asset and operation during the process. The IRP gathers information about the financial situation of the business and he forms a committee of creditors. 
द कमिटी ऑफ क्रेडिटर्स इज अ ग्रुप ऑफ क्रेडिटर्स हु विल मेक इम्पॉर्टेंट डिसीजन अबाउट वॉट टू डू नेक्स्ट द आई आर पी विद द हेल्प ऑफ द फिनेंशियल एक्सपर्ट्स लुक्स एट डिफरेंट ऑप्शन टू हेल्प द बिजनेस दे मे कंसिडर रीस्ट्रक्चरिंग द बिजनेस और फाइंडिंग न्यू इन्वेस्टर्स टू इंजेक्ट मनी और दे मे इवन सजेस्ट टू मर्ज द बिजनेस विद अनदर कंपनी इफ अ वाइएबल प्लान इज प्रपोज एंड द कमिटी ऑफ क्रेडिटर्स अग्रीज टू विट द प्लान इज सबमिटेड टू द एन सी एल टी फॉर अप्रूवल फॉर एग्जाम्पल लेट से अ ग्रुप ऑफ इन्वेस्टर्स इज इंटरेस्टेड इन इन्वेस्टिंग इन द बिजनेस टू हेल्प इट रिकवर इफ द मेजोरिटी ऑफ द क्रेडिटर्स इन द कमिटी ऑफ क्रेडिटर्स दैट इज मोर दैन टू थर्ड्स अग्री टू दिस प्लान इट मूव टू द नेक्स्ट स्टेप वन से एन सी एल टी अप्रूव द प्लान द बिजनेस इज बाउंड टू फॉलो इट If everything goes well the business starts to improve with the new investment and financial support and it can get back on track if the resolution plan works and the business becomes healthy again the insolvency process is considered a success and the business continues to operate creditors get back their money and the economy benefits from a functioning business Unfortunately, if the CBOC cannot agree on a workable plan or the proposed plans do not succeed, the last resort is liquidation. In this case, the business would be closed down and its asset would be sold to repay the creditors. However, this is always seen as a last option since the aim is to save the business whenever possible. So insolvency resolution is like a structured process to help the struggling business get back on their feet and repay their debts. Here you should also take a note about the time frame. See, the original IBC process had a deadline of 180 days for completing the corporate insolvency resolution process which could be extended up to 90 days if needed. This meant that the entire resolution process was expected to be completed within 270 days. However, in 2019 the IBC was amended to increase the maximum time limit for the CIRP to 330 days including any extensions. This means that the resolution process should be completed within 330 days from the initiation of the corporate insolvency resolution process. The amendment was made to address concerns over delays in resolving cases within the initial 270 day period. The extension to 330 days was introduced to give more time for complex cases to be resolved effectively while still maintaining a time bound mechanism for resolving insolvency cases. See the IBC's performance has been relatively better than the other recovery mechanisms but it still has some issues there are lack of operational NCLT benches most of the benches of NCLT remain non operational because of lack of infrastructure or inadequate staff another major issue is the low approval rate of resolution plans also the slow judicial process in india makes a resolution processes to drag on above all these challenges ibc has helped faster recoveries in resolutions as compared to the earlier mechanisms so this is all about ibc with the learn points in mind now we will move on to the next article discussion look at this news article see Even after it was urged by our prime minister to meet the Tamil aspirations and fulfill its commitment to implement the 13th amendment Sri Lanka's ruling party rejected the prospect the general secretary of Sri Lanka said that president Ranil Wickremesinghe has no mandate to implement the 13th amendment unless he obtained a fresh mandate for it from the people this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us learn about india sri lanka relation see india and sri lanka are two south asian nations situated in the indian ocean region right so geographically sri lanka is located just off the southern coast of india separated by the pak strait this proximity has played a significant role in shaping the relation between the two countries the indian ocean is a strategically important waterway for trade and military operations and sri lanka's location at the cross road of major shipping lanes makes it a critical point of control for india now talking about india sri lanka relations see both the countries have a long history of cultural religious and trade ties 
dating back to the ancient times there are strong cultural ties between the two countries with many sri lankans tracing their heritage to india buddhism which originated in india is also an important religion in sri lanka india is sri lanka's third largest export destination after the us and uk more than 60 percentage of sri lanka's export enjoy the benefits of the india sri lanka free trade agreement india is also a major investor in sri lanka foreign direct investment from india amounted to around 1.7 billion us dollars over the years from 2005 to 2019 India and Sri Lanka also conduct frequent joint military exercises like Mitra Shakti and naval exercises like Slinex. Now, talking about the issues in India Sri Lanka relationship. Firstly, the killing of Indian fishermen by the Sri Lankan Navy is a lingering issue between these two nations. This happens whenever the Indian fishermen had crossed into the waters of Sri Lanka. Secondly, China's rapidly growing economic footprint in Sri Lanka is straining India Sri Lanka relations. Sri Lanka is now a victim to China's debt trap diplomacy, especially after the handing over of the strategic southern port of Hambantota to China on a 99 year lease. Third issue is regarding the 13th amendment of the Sri Lankan constitution. See We know that the ethnic conflict in Sri Lanka is a long-standing issue that has its root in historical grievances and tensions between the Sinhalese and the Tamil community. See, Sri Lanka, formerly known as Ceylon, was ruled by various kingdoms and colonial powers over the centuries. The British colonial administration in particular introduced policies that favored the minority Tamil community, leading to tensions between the Sinhalese majority and Tamil minority. After gaining independence in 1948, Sri Lanka's politics was dominated by Sinhalese Buddhist nationalist ideology. This sought to establish a Sinhalese dominated state. The government implemented policies that marginalized the Tamil community including discriminatory language policies and preferential treatment for Sinhalese in education and employment. As a response to the discriminatory policies, Tamil nationalist movements emerged and they demanded equal rights and autonomy for the Tamil speaking regions in the north and east of Sri Lanka. In the 1970s and 1980s the conflict took a violent turn as militant groups like the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Eelam began an armed struggle for Tamil self determination the LTTE under the leadership of Velu Pillai Prabaharan sought to establish an independent Tamil state called Tamil Eelam so this is the historical background of the ethnic conflict in Sri Lanka Now the 13th amendment to the Sri Lankan constitution was a significant legislative outcome of the Indo-Sri Lanka accord which was signed in July 1987 between Indian Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi and Sri Lankan President J R Jayawardene it was an attempt to address the ethnic conflict and find a political solution now what are the key features of this 13th amendment see The 13th amendment to the Sri Lankan constitution created provincial councils in the country. These are like smaller governments for different regions. The idea behind these councils was to share some powers with the local communities in all 9 provinces of Sri Lanka even in areas where most people are Sinhalese. This way the province can have a say in managing certain things like education, health, agriculture, housing, land and police within their own region. It was an effort to give more control to local people in how their areas are governed. Then the amendment initially allowed for the merger of northern and eastern provinces into one administrative unit known as the Northeastern Provincial Council. However, this merger was later demerged in 2007 following a Supreme Court verdict. See, the 13th amendment was a significant step towards addressing Tamil grievances and promoting devolution. but it has faced challenges and oppositions from various parties singlist national parties saw it as an excessive power sharing while the ltte and some other tamil nationalist groups viewed it as insufficient in addressing their aspirations 
till date the amendment represents the only constitutional provisions on the settlement of the long pending tamil question even though india supports its implementation the sri lankan government is yet to fully implement the 13th amendment so this is again a chain in the bilateral relations this is all that i wanted to discuss regarding this news article with the long points in mind now we will move on to the next article discussion look at this editorial The crux of this article is that there has been recent controversy over soundness of data collection procedures in India. An article by Shamika Ravi who is a member of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister was published in a leading national daily on July 7, 2023. That article had raised doubts on the soundness of the data collection procedures of some of the surveys this is even for important surveys like the national sample survey national family health survey and periodic labor force survey overall the article emphasizes the importance of improving sample designs and maintaining the quality of data collection methods to ensure the accuracy and reliability of national level surveys so in this discussion we shall see some important issues in the data collection process and what can be done to rectify those issues now before getting into the discussion the syllabus relevant to this discussion is highlighted here you can go through it but before we move ahead i would like to clarify one thing here census versus survey in simple words a census means collecting data from everyone in a population while a sample survey just collects data from a smaller group and makes prediction about the entire population so this is the basic difference between census and sample survey see the author mentions that there are some issues with the data collection methods we'll see them one by one firstly the surveys in question are the national sample survey and national family health survey and periodic labor force survey they are essential tools for gathering information about various socio economic indicators such as employment health and household characteristics see from 2011-12 to 2019 to 21 these surveys consistently underestimated the proportion of urban population or overestimated the rural population this has led to underestimating improvements across the country The issue is crucial because policy makers and researchers rely on these surveys to make informed decisions and plan welfare programs. See, the surveys adopt scientific sample designs and they have undergone revisions approved by esteemed committees and bodies comprising experts in economic statistics and demography. These designs ensure that the collected data is representative of the entire population. so it makes the survey widely acknowledged even at international level however there is always room for improvement in sample designs see one issue raised in the article is bias in population estimation the surveys are not meant to directly estimate the total population or the number of households they mainly focus on estimating socio economic indicators so to make the estimates representative of the entire population data users adjust the survey based estimates using projected population figures based on the census let's take an example there is a small town and a survey randomly selects 10 households to estimate the average income the average income of these 10 households is found to be rupees 5000 The census data reveals that there are 100 households in this town. So to estimate the average income for the entire town, we use the data we have obtained from the survey. For 10 households, the average income is rupees 5000. So for 100 households, it will be 5000 into 100 divided by 10. So the average income would be rupees 50000. so this way the survey based estimate is adjusted to represent the entire town's population using projected population figures the bias in this scenario is due to the small sample size of the survey when the survey randomly selected only 10 households out of the total 100 households it used a sample size that is relatively very small compared to the total population because of the small sample size the survey may not accurately capture the true variability of household incomes in the entire town 
Another concern raised is the underestimation of the urban population and the use of outdated sampling frames. However, the surveys depend on the population census list which are complete in coverage though they are updated only once in 10 years. The surveys partially correct the frame for urbanization using the latest list of urban frame survey blocks. This helps to ensure that census towns are treated as part of the urban sampling frame. Furthermore, there is a systemic bias in the response rate, meaning households with higher level incomes may be less likely to share information. To address this, the survey methodology allows for substituting non-responding households with similar ones. However, this could introduce some downward bias in certain estimates related to income levels. The article suggests some remedies such as exploring alternative source to capture richer households, expanding the coverage of UFS frames. Also, the quality of data collection can be improved by enhancing training, inspection, validation and publicity measures. By using advanced sampling methods like stratified sampling or cluster sampling, we can ensure better representation of diverse population groups. Here, cluster sampling means that only selected clusters are sampled. Next is providing incentives to encourage participation in the survey and engaging with communities to build trust. Also, establishing rigorous quality control mechanisms including regular checks and validation procedures during data collection can improve the quality of data collected. Giving proper training to surveyors and interviewers to administer the survey accurately and ethically. We can use the new technologies like AI machine learning for data collection to reduce errors and improve efficiency. Developing survey instruments in multiple languages will be useful to adopt with India's linguistic diversity. Finally, we can involve local communities in the survey process to better understand their needs and challenges. By understanding these issues and implementing appropriate measures, sample survey methodology in India can be strengthened, leading to more accurate and reliable data for policy making and research. To conclude, the surveys in India have room for improvement. However, they remain valuable tools for gathering crucial data. And it's important to recognize their strengths while working towards enhancing their accuracy and representativeness. By strengthening training, validation and data quality measures, we can ensure that the surveys continue to provide reliable insights into the country's socio-economic realities. Now, with the learned points in mind, now we will move on to the next article discussion. Look at this news article. Yesterday, the Indian Space Research Organization announced that the PSLV C-56 carrying Singapore's DSSAR satellite will be launched on July 30 from Sri Harikota. The DSSAR satellite will be launched along with six other satellites. DSSAR would be launched into a near equatorial orbit at 5 degrees inclination and 535 km altitude. This satellite will be used to support the satellite imagery requirements of various agencies within the government of Singapore. This is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us quickly go through the features of PSLV. But before that, we will also understand about this DSSAR satellite. See, DSSAR is a satellite jointly developed by DSGA, that is Defense Science and Technology Agency. This represents the government of Singapore and ST Engineering, a Singaporean engineering company. Its main purpose is to support the satellite imagery requirements of various government agencies in Singapore. Additionally, ST Engineering will utilize DSSAR for providing commercial customers with advanced geospatial services and higher responsiveness imagery. See, DSSAR is equipped with a sophisticated payload known as Synthetic Aperture Radar. This was developed by Israel Aerospace Industries. This SAR technology allows the satellite to capture high resolution images regardless of weather conditions day or night. 
see we know that radar is a system that uses radio waves to detect objects and their distances sar is a unique type of radar that does something extraordinary it creates highly detailed images of the earth's surface just like pictures using radio waves but how does it do that let me explain see normal radar sends out short pulses of radio waves and listens for the echoes that bounce back from objects it helps us detect airplanes ships or even storms but sar works differently instead of quick pulses sar sends out a continuous stream of radio waves as it moves along its path see traditional optical satellites may face limitations in capturing images during cloudy or dark conditions but sar enables dssar to overcome these restrictions so with these points now we will see about pslv see pslv is nothing but a launch vehicle launchers or launch vehicles are used to do carry spacecraft to space india has two operational launchers PSLV that is polar satellite launch vehicle and GSLV geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle see isro previously used a small lift launch vehicle called small satellite launch vehicle or SSLV this was used to deliver payload capacity up to 600 kg to low earth orbit that is 500 km and 300 kg to sun synchronous orbit See as I mentioned earlier PSLV stands for polar satellite launch vehicle the reason it is called polar is because it specializes in launching satellites into polar orbits see polar orbit is a type of orbit that goes over or passes very close to the earth's geographic poles when a satellite is in a polar orbit it travels from one pole to the another covering the entire planet on each orbit know that satellites in polar orbits are used for a variety of purposes they are excellent for earth observation and remote sensing because they can cover the entire planet providing global coverage they are also commonly used for environmental monitoring weather forecasting and scientific research but you should also know that pslv is versatile and it can launch satellites into different types of orbits it can send satellites into polar orbits like we mentioned earlier but it can also put them into geostationary transfer orbits and even sun synchronous orbits see polar satellite launch vehicle is the third generation launch vehicle of india it is the first indian launch vehicle to be equipped with liquid stages after its first successful launch in october 1994 pslv emerged as the reliable and versatile workhorse launch vehicle of india during the 1994 to 2017 period alone the vehicle has launched 48 indian satellites and 208 satellites for customers from abroad besides the vehicle successfully launched two spacecraft chandrayaan 1 in 2008 and mars orbiter spacecraft in 2013 that later traveled to moon and mars respectively now talking about the specifications it can carry a payload of about 1750 kg to sun synchronous polar orbits of 600 kg altitude and 1425 kg to sub geosynchronous transfer orbit there are four stages in pslv's journey from lift off to placing satellites into orbit a large solid rocket motor forms the first stage an earth storable liquid stage is the second stage a high performance solid rocket motor as the third stage and a liquid stage with engines as fourth stage so this is all that i wanted to discuss regarding this news article now with the learned points in mind we will move on to the next part of our discussion which is practice questions question number 1 consider the following 1 production of polar satellite launch vehicle 2 transponder leasing 3 building communication and earth observation satellites 4 transfer of technology developed by isro 5 marketing of products emanating out of isro activities how many of the above mentioned areas are the business areas of new space india limited see the correct answer is option c all five 
New Space India Limited is a wholly owned government of India company under the administrative control of the Department of Space. NSIL is a commercial arm of ISRO. Its prime responsibility is to enable Indian industries to take up high technology space related activities. It is also responsible for promoting and commercializing the products and services emanating from the Indian space program. So all these areas mentioned here are the business areas of NSIL. Question number 2. In the context of India-Sri Lanka relations, which Indian Prime Minister signed the historic Indo-Sri Lanka Accord in 1987 aiming to resolve the ethnic conflict in Sri Lanka? The correct answer is option B, Rajiv Gandhi. The Indo-Sri Lanka Accord also known as Rajiv Jayavardhane Accord was signed on July 29, 1987. The accord aimed to address the ethnic conflict in Sri Lanka and provide a framework for resolution of the long-standing issues between the Sinhalese and Tamil communities. Question number 3. Consider the following statements about semiconductor chips. Statement number 1. The node number of a semiconductor chip represents the gate length of the transistor. Statement number 2. As gate length of the transistor decreases, the device density decreases. Statement number 3. Lower the device density, higher the performance and efficiency of the semiconductor chips. Statement number 4. Taiwan's TSMC single-handedly manufactures roughly 50% of the world's semiconductors. How many of the statements given above is or are correct? See here, statement number 1 is incorrect. Since 1990s, the node number of the semiconductor chip does not represent any physical property like gate length or half pitch. Statement number 2 is also incorrect. As gate length of the transistor decreases, the device density increases. Then statement number 3 is also incorrect. Higher the device density, higher the performance and efficiency of the semiconductor chips. Then statement number 4 is correct. The Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company of Taiwan manufactures around 50% of the world's semiconductor. So the correct answer for this question is option A only one. Now this is a quiz question for you. You can easily answer this question from the discussion that we had today. Read the question carefully and post the answers in the comment box. Displayed here is the main question for your practice. Interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment box below. If you have found our video to be useful, hit the like button, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel. Happy learning!